Welcome to what I believe is the second car cast in the history of KSO. The first one was in Stillwater. Correct. All first one in Stillwater with Jeff Martin after K-State upset Oklahoma State. In 2017. In 2017 on the road. Uh, it's, it's We're doing this because we had planned to stay the night tonight in Arlington and wrap up our work on Big 12 Football Media Days, but... Uh, good news is that K-State on, what is this, on Wednesday has a basketball media availability at 3 in the afternoon. So we need to head back. We don't want to not do our pod, though. So Derek and I are here in the car recording. You may hear some GPS. Flando's behind the wheel instead of the board. And I can't, D.Y., I can't see you either because I'm facing forward. So it's going to be like a weird podcast where I don't see you as I talk to you. Yeah, I might interrupt you a little bit more in this one, but that's okay. It is, Absolutely. It is the KSO Show, presented by Tallgrass Tap House, of course, 320 East Point in Manhattan, Kansas. We are driving back from Big 12 Football Media Days. We're in about to get to Sulphur, Oklahoma. I want to talk about everything, D.Y., because we've got six hours till we're home. Exactly. But let's do a lot of K-State first. So if somebody's listening to this and they don't want to hear us talk about how great we think Matt Campbell looks, they can hear all the K-State stuff first. K-State did go today, today being Tuesday. You're probably listening to this on Wednesday. Kansas State had Chris Kleiman, Skylar Thompson, Wyatt Hubert, Dalton Schoen, Trey Deshaun, Trey Deshaun Denzel Ranger Goolsby. Walker, and then Denzel Goolsby. Right? But we didn't get to see Denzel very much. Correct. So, D.Y., I don't know where to start. Let's start with Chris Kleiman said a lot of fascinating things today. Let's just kind of go one by one. You spoke with him a lot. Um, I'm just going to start with one that I was around for, though. I asked the question about I, – I was surprised, personally, that Kansas State got to 18 commits basically by the end of June. And I was curious, especially when Chris Kleiman had said earlier in the presser, you know, you can't know these kids for three months. It's got to be a year and a half. So I said, with that in mind, are you a little surprised you got to this? And he flat out said no. So, Derek, let's, let's start with recruiting. I thought he talked a lot about recruiting. It was very interesting. What did that comment mean to you, that he just said, no, I'm not surprised we had 18 commits. That's what I expected at this point. Yeah, at first I didn't know what to, to make of that statement and how, how he answered your, your question. But he kind of explained it himself, too, because obviously he's very well uh, – he articulates himself very well and he did it again and it's just the utmost faith he's had in his coaching staff and he knew that they would come through and and he loves uh that part uh just the way they do that part of their job uh, he knows that i mean i think he said it he's got a, a staff full of just recruiting grinders and he said that's really one of the main reasons why he loves the staff that he did he built let's keep on that recruiting topic because something i think you noticed derek throughout these couple of days and you talked about on the boards and on the site and you retweeted some stuff from k-state about it is i think they chris Kleiman. i'm still on your idea for the record that that chris Kleiman and and kansas state use this as a bit of an opportunity to really get out to recruits at kansas state you are going to have a chance to play early i thought they used this setting as a chance to make that pitch and um, i think it's a pretty wise use of this time yeah it was kind of timely because i think in the recruiting notebook we that we put out right before the big 12 media day i i said even when you know, in his introductory presser when he talked about, you know, dominating the Kansas City Metro on the recruiting trail in the state of Kansas and the state of Missouri, even though we want to think that we're the intended recipients of that to deliver that message to the fans, I don't think the fans or us were actually the intended recipient for that message. I think it was more about, you know, the coaches and the recruits. He wanted to, you know, put his agenda out there and let them know to kind of create, you know, that first buzz on the recruiting trail. And it really worked if you think about it because then they got, you know, most of those kids to visit not two, three weeks later. So I think that did, you know, meet its intentions. It just wasn't intended for us. And I think today was more of the the same. Um, It was just a day full of recruiting pitches and someone, you know, you know, tossed up, you know, a fat pitch for Chris Kleiman in one of the questions. And when they asked him, you know, how are you going to bring in the the top caliber recruits to Manhattan, Kansas? And instead of the line that we we tend to hear quite a bit of how tough it's it is to recruit to Kansas State in, in Manhattan. Instead, Coach Kleiman said, why not come to Kansas State? At first, he said, you know, you talk about the opportunity to, you know, to play in a system where we're going to, uh, prioritize getting the ball in the hands of our playmakers you get to play early you'll have the opportunity to play early no promises but the opportunity will be there and then on top of that you know playing a system that has a tremendous nfl pedigree you are listening to the kso show right by case it online and of course tall grass tap house bourbon and baker and harry's Derek young matt hall grant flanders behind the wheel Derek, let's continue that on that point 
an example of that was really given to you today, or around, when you were around it today, at least, I believe. It was kind of unprompted. Uh, Joshua Youngblood, a name you've written about a number of times. A lot of people, not just us, you know, have talked about on the boards or on Twitter as being a guy likely to play. I believe more or less unprompted. He brought him up today, Derek, as a guy who's, who's going to play almost certainly this coming season. Yeah, the answer that he used Joshua Youngblood for was more of a pivot. He, he had uh, probably he, he had to respond to, you know, consecutive, you know, interesting questions about still asking him about Hunter Ryzen. Right. And at, I think at the end of, the, of that, he, I think he just kind of wanted to get off the Hunter Ryzen subject. So in an effort to do that, he was able to pivot towards Joshua Youngblood, a guy that he clearly likes a lot and just, you know, quite bluntly said Joshua Youngblood's going to play right away and he's going to play a lot for, for, for Kansas State this year. So uh, most assuredly, it sounds like he's not going to redshirt. Another, you know, young guy we talked a little about was Jack Sinine. He referenced him needing to be ready. But I want to stay at receiver because you asked another question about a couple of guys. Harry Trotter, who's a running back, of course, but why King Gill at receiver. And Chris Kleiman gave you a pretty direct answer about why, why, why King Gill went on scholarship. Yeah, why King Gill went on scholarship because Coach Kleiman absolutely believes, and it was a ton of conviction behind us, that he believes that why King Gill was his best wide receiver during spring football. So that that's uh, you know it means a lot. That's the, the testimony to what he's done. But that's a strong statement. And then the most noteworthy thing wasn't necessarily wide wide receiver, probably newsworthy. But Marcus Hayes, the safety, uh, was did not get his waiver to play right away. So he'll have to sit out a year. I would think that was probably the most newsworthy thing we heard today. I agree, and I was going to bring that up because I think you asked the Marcus Hayes question yep. and got that answer. How big of a deal is that? Because to me, you know, not trying to put words in your mouth, but not only do they not get a guy who could have helped in the return game, he may have been their top return guy this year and play at safety. I mean, unless I'm totally wrong, I'm I'm almost certain, though, he's going to lose this year now. I don't think he has a red shirt left, so he would have been eligible as a sophomore this year. Not only do they not miss him, he'll be a junior next year. So all that stuff, you're losing a return guy, a safety, and a year of eligibility. How big a news was that today to, to learn that? Uh, I think it was pretty strong news and pretty important news, getting pretty critical. Uh, losing a year is not very fun for anyone, not necessarily fair when other people are getting it that are probably maybe not even as deserving, not that he really was a, a sure. deserving of that uh, waiver, but like Coach Clavin said, there's no consistency to how those decisions are made, and I probably agree with that, but I think you've made it clear – as, as well as anyone it hurts because he's not going to get that year back and instead of he's going he gets he gets one yet less year of playing football yeah I mean that's exactly right another thing I think that Mr. Kleiman told you today was you you asked about backup quarterback and and you could talk about it I think he stopped short you know of saying John Holcomb's the guy but he made pretty clear I think John Holcomb's probably gonna be the guy yeah he said I think John is going to be our guy meaning the second string quarterback behind Skyler Thompson but to be fair and I, and I think you've made a pretty good light of it there there wasn't a ton of conviction behind that I don't think it's a concrete decision but it was more of like a status update of right now that they had to play a game tomorrow you know John Holcomb's their second string quarterback we may get back to Chris Kleiman of course we had a lot of opportunities today he had the podium he had the sidebar he had the breakout at the end so there's probably some things he's talked about that are important that I'm going to forget but I think Maybe let's run around and talk about some of the players that were there today, either what we learned from them or what we experienced from them. Uh, Might as well start with Skylar Thompson, you know, a guy that you were around with Grant, you know, Flanders. Why did I call him Grant there? It's Flando. Um, What did you take away from Skylar? Uh, The obvious being relationships better with the head coach and that kind of thing. But what did you take away from your time with Skylar Thompson today in in Arlington? Yeah, I think he's just more comfortable. Uh, He just... I feel like he just feels a little bit freer. And a lot of that comes from the relationship with his head coach. But, I mean, it's hard to not ignore that because that that is a big reason or a, b- a big thing when it comes to Skylar Thompson, when it comes to his career at Kansas State. So it seems like he, he just feels a little bit more looser, freer, more comfortable in his own shoes, in his, you know, in his own body. Um, and hopefully we'll see, but may, maybe that will, you know, manifest itself on the field I think that that would be the hope at the end of the day and and a big thing that I took away and he said it as much he he doesn't feel like he's looking over his shoulder as much that helps me lead to this you know you talked to Trey Deshaun today as well Um, I'm going to sidebar for a second if you're listening to this and you haven't gone to listen to the Bosco boys show from Big 20 days I would tell you to do so because they're going to do a better job than us or anybody of letting you know, like get to know some of these players. Cause I was thinking of Trey Deshaun and his Trey One Sauce, which is, was something that was learned by the Boscos, so they'll teach you about that. What I wanted to get to, though, was Trey Deshaun told you about how Alex Delton's still a friend, the guy he was competing with 
Skylar Thompson last year. Um, so he talked about that, of course, but he talked a lot to you about the rivalry with Kansas. So what did you learn in your time speaking with K-State's cream coat wearing, was it cream colored? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cream colored coat wearing defensive tackle Trader Sean. Yeah. It, That's I, harder to say than you would than you would think. I think some of what we learned it came from when your conversation with Reggie Walker yeah. and that Trader Sean was probably the guy that wanted <laughs> yeah. to be there the least, but it was still a really good interview. He, he smiles when, whenever anyone talks to him, so... It uh, makes it really an easy conversation to have and one that's really enjoyable on our part. So I thank Trey for that. And at the same time, I think that, you know, he, he was pretty blunt, pretty forward, and that, you know, despite Kansas State typically not circling the KU game on the calendar every year, he, he kind of does because obviously he's a Kansas kid, so that game's going to mean more to him already and no matter what. But at the same time, he's one of those guys that has a chip on his shoulder about a certain team. They hear a lot in recruiting because they didn't want him or he wasn't good enough to play there. And KU did want Trey Deshaun, so that's a chip on the shoulder, and, and he kind of, I wouldn't say holds that against them, but he uses that kind of as a bulletin board material when it comes to that game. And then in terms of Alex Dellum, the funny thing, he, at Kansas State practice, the quarterbacks wear color green, so they can't be contacted. Uh, to, just to you know, keep them fresh, keep them healthy, that's what every school does. But at Kansas State, they wear the color green. And Trey Deshaun says he's messaged Alex Delta more than a few times that, hey, it's not going to be two hands on, on the green jersey anymore. You know, It's going to be a little bit more contact the next time I see you. <laughs> Denzel Goolsby also there. I never spoke with him. I assume you didn't either. He did not. Can he, you just talk a little bit maybe why he was there for people who are confused about why was Goolsby there and then not talking to the media? Yeah, he's a part of that Big 12 program that's pretty, uh, I think, uh, exclusive company. Yep. They don't typically um, – assign a bunch of players to that program. It's the Champions for Life program. I think they only pick out a couple. So, I mean, not every school is represented. But they certainly uh, wanted Denzel Goolsby to be a part of that because, just because he's a he's the epitome of one of those, like, I wouldn't say perfect, but just a great student athlete that understands what the, to the value of that uh, education, the value of that degree. And he uses that to uh, expand his brand to – uh, he doesn't let the free education use him. He uses his free education. So um, they lo they love him as part of just you know having him front and center. I think he's kind of going to be like that bill one of those billboard athletes for the Big 12 this upcoming season. It sure feels that way. Now the other three K State Wildcats there. I I talked a little more. I'm sure you did too. And there's probably some some color you can add to this. But Reggie Walker uh, was one I spoke with. One of the first things he said to me was, you know, when we started talking was, I won't even see Denzel, the Big 12, grabbed him as soon as we got here and took him away for that Champions for Life. <laughs> so you're right about that. But Reggie Walker was a guy who uh, I thought it was neat that he was able to admit and not be afraid to say, yeah, it was meaningful to see my name first team all Big 12 because it should have been, for one. That's a great accomplishment to see, and I think it's cool he admitted that. But he knows it doesn't really mean anything, just like being picked ninth in the Big 12 doesn't really mean anything. He thinks, you know, K-State can have one of the best defensive lines in the Big 12 or the best. And while I would say, yeah, maybe not, it's not a crazy thought, T.Y. I mean, if he is a first-team All-Big 12 player, Wyatt Hebert's a guy who gets some recognition on All-Big 12 teams. I think USA Today had him as a first-team freshman All-American last year. Trey Deshaun is an All-Big 12-ish, you know, caliber player. Is that a crazy thought to think that K-State could have one of the better D-lines potentially in the Big 12? Uh, it's not a crazy thought. They have a lot, you know, obviously, yeah, they got a, they got a, a ways to go to kind of reach that uh, distinction, so to speak. But uh, it's they're if they all swung and connected on their highest right. of potential, then absolutely. But they got they got to thread the needle to get there. But it's not out of reach. Uh, spoke with Dalton Schoen quite a bit. He was a lot of fun. I don't I don't know. Dalton Schoen's a guy we've had a lot in media settings, and he's always been good. But he was just fun today. Like he was happy to be there. Um, him and it's Reggie Walker yeah. would probably lead the best dressed on the Kansas uh, State side. You don't think Trey Deshaun was in uh, there? I mean, but, Reggie, it, I but thought, his pants didn't match very well. Sure, but I thought the effort was good. I mean, <laughs> I thought it was it was all well and done. A couple of things about was Skyler. So, 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 yeah, I thought Skyler looked a uh, Flando off off Mike. You know, driving says <laughs> Skyler looked good. Skyler he did. He needed good. to iron that jacket a little bit. I mean, more. we're not going to give any love to <laughs> Hubert's like pulled back ponytail hair. I love that too. So I mean, a lot of good looks out there. Uh, let's talk about you know Dalton Schoen though for a second. I think that he was honest too. I mean, like I asked him, I said, hey, would you rather be in an offense where you've got two receivers out there throwing it 20 times a game or four out there throwing it 40 or 45? And and he's like, well, honestly, you know, the multi-receiver one because that's what I'm used to and that kind of thing. But he was very positive about the opportunities he's still going to have. He thinks that if somebody believes K-State's going to run it and not throw it, that they're, that they're silly. And he believes K-State's going to have a great chance to make big plays in the passing game better than in the past. You know, D.Y., 
way back when we were in Frisco and you kind of took the offensive side of, of covering North Dakota State when you were there for that game. That's something you noted too. I mean, receivers aren't going to be used as much, but I mean, they're still going to have a chance to make big plays down the field in this offense. That, that it, was, it was a chunk play offense, at least the one we saw from North Dakota State last year. So while they they threw it, I think they averaged less than 20 passes a game. And, yeah, and 18 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Those, those are real numbers. I think the yards per game still stacked up against some of the better programs in the nation when it came to that element of the offense, just because like when they did throw it, they were very explosive when they did it. No, they certainly, certainly were. So we've talked Reggie Walker, we've talked Dalton Schoen. I guess the final one left to discuss is, is Wyatt Hubert. Uh, to me, I mean, the news, I don't know if it's the news, we all know Wyatt Hubert's bigger. I mean, you, you look at it for two yeah. seconds and you know he's put on a significant amount of size. He said specifically he's gone from 245 to 265. You always hear this, that it didn't affect his speed or anything like that, but he swore up and down it does not. I don't want to put a wrong stat out there, but I think you heard his vert was still pretty good. He said to me all of his testing numbers improved. So to hear him say it, and I tend to believe him, he's 265 and the same explosive athlete that he was last year. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's why everyone has very high expectations for him and why if you ask the local media that it's probably more informed and connected to this team and its current state, nothing against Reggie Walker, we would have probably picked Wyatt Hubert over Reggie Walker. That's, that's correct, and perhaps we were wrong and Walker would be a better pick, but I think that's that's fair to say. KSO show on K-State Online. We are now coming upon exit 74, that's which important. would take you to Kimberly, <laughs> yeah, Kimberly Road in case you're trying to figure out where we are right now. We've talked through all of the you know K-State players, the K-State coaches, just to wrap, just to wrap it up. I guess I said to you as we were walking out of. Yeah, you should wrap it up yeah, that way. As, yeah. I, as we were walk, thank you. As we were walking out of the hotel today, the Sheraton, I said to you as a, as a Kansas State fan, I don't, I don't know how successful Chris Klein and the staff are or aren't going to be. I really don't. But I think I have a thing. Everything I would want them to do, they're pretty much doing. They're doing and, all the right things. And it felt, it just felt. I mean, Fresh. I know people are tired of hearing it, but it could not have felt more different today. Yeah, and I, I and not agree. just from him, but from everybody. You know, Kenny Lanou, Ryan Lackey, uh, Emily Stark. I mean, every, you know, everybody there. Bo Savage. I'm, I'm forgetting names. But like, there were so many people there, all the players and all the coaches, Gene Taylor, all the administration who just felt so proud, so confident. Um, and I believe they're all pulling in the same direction. I, I, I think so, too. And, and something that I that I kind of – I guess the most palpable thing to me, and, and I know that some are wouldn't, won't agree with this because they like the nostalgic – Feel to that Kansas State had and, and for you know for you know tons of years, but I liked that there was no hint of hey remember how things were or that, or yeah. or hey we know how hard it is to recruit. It was all about why not, why not us? Like why why are we looked at this way? I mean everything that you've seen in social media for several months or anything that's come out of the Kansas State athletic department or football department for several months whether it be on social media or in a media setting it was all consistent with what we saw today and that is and he even mentioned it they're building a new and what they think a better brand i want to move on to the rest of the league here in just a second but i do have another case state thought even though i said i was going to wrap it up because of what you wrote and what you just said um i think an unintended benefit of hiring chris climate from north dakota state has been they took a, a head coach and about half their staff and I think you wrote this in your last recruiting notebook that more uh, that came from a place that was harder to recruit to than Manhattan, Kansas, even at the FCS level, which people will just assume. You know, and that they had great players; they yeah. succeeded in doing it. But just from a flying people in, travel, uh, population, all that stuff, Fargo was a tougher sell than Manhattan. So they get to come from a place that, and I know it's FCS, to FBS, all that kind of stuff. But no, like you said, they're just going to say no. This is better than what we were at before for all these things, and the facilities are great. This kind of stuff. They literally, they sincerely believe. They are at a great program, and it shouldn't be that hard to recruit there. And I and I know that some on the coaching staff absolutely believe that they've already had an easier time recruiting to Manhattan than they right. ever did in Fargo. Absolutely. Let's move on to the rest of the league. You know, let's kind of just go team by team, Derek. I'm going to ask you, what did you think about it? I'm sure they'll come into some conversations from what you say about what you thought. So let's see if I can go in order of how they went. Kansas and Les Miles was first. Um, it's been talked about a lot, D.Y. It was, it, was an in, it was an interesting day for Les Miles at the podium on Monday in Arlington. Yeah, everyone's seen the video. I'm not going to go yep. over detail by detail. I think we kind of beat it to death, whether it be on the message board or even on KMAM with John Kurtz and right. recent votes. So, But at the end of the day, I'll say this. Um, 
I don't know Les Miles has never been a great public speaker I know that he's always uh, made headlines with his press conferences but I don't think a I don't think he, when, even when those things happened, that it was as much of a struggle as, as what it was uh, what we saw on Monday. Because I think in the other times where it happened, I think that was more of just of his character shining right. through and and just his sense of charisma, which is could be a little bit different. I agree that it is, but I think Monday was still a little bit more of a struggle than say his character shining through. But I will also say, and I think it's we have to be you know transparent and everything, and I and I've explain this to you guys that I did go to his breakout session even though he because he didn't have a, uh, a sidebar. sidebar but I did go to his breakout session and he was much more I don't want to say put together but much more aware still I wouldn't say 100% on point or 100% sharp like you would say see from like Gary Patterson or someone of that ilk but uh, he was and it probably more comfortable around people that he knows and has developed a relationship with, but he was better in that setting. Right. And I think there's a couple of things. I doubt there's many Kansas fans listening to the KSO show, but I know there's a lot very frustrated that media, you know, as it covers Kansas state was, um, a little bit worried about how Les Miles spoke at that press conference. But I'll say this, I think he's done a great job so far. You know, we talk about, I mean, they haven't played a game, so yeah. I mean, we can't, we can't judge anything on the field. They got 21 commits. I mean, I think they're doing a nice job. So I could sit here and say I think he's done a good job so far. And I think I think a K-State fan, it's it's hard to say that he hasn't if you're a K-State fan because they haven't played a game. But at the same time, if you're a Kansas fan, it's got to be impossible to watch that press conference with any bit of an open mind and not think this this is concerning. Yeah. Okay, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah well said. I agree. We don't need to keep talking about it. I think the last thing I'll say on K-State, K, you've already, you've already hit it, is it, it's going to be a bigger rivalry than it has been in some time. Um, and I know that's not fun for K-State fans to hear in part because they've dominated the series for the last quarter of a century. Um, but it's going to be exciting, you know, and it doesn't mean the dominance can't continue. But at least right now, these programs see themselves as somewhat even footing with both new head coaches in the same state. And it, it type of things feeling different, Derek. The K-State-K rivalry feels 100% different. It feels 100% different because it is th- that I'm probably – uncomfortable truth that K-State fans are about to come to that the sim- the programs are a little bit more similar than than different at this point in time. Let's move on. I think it was Mike Gundy and Oklahoma State second. Does that sound right to you? Uh, well, that's what we're going to talk They were the about. first day. That's where, Yeah, yeah. They were uh, second on the first day. Is that right? Yeah, that or TCU. I don't oh, know. it was TCU. TCU went second. Let's do TCU then. Yep, Gundy was definitely third. So the Horn Frogs, something we've talked about off off camp or off camera, off off pod and I'm probably off the site is I think both of us went to Big 12 Media Days. I can speak for myself. Yeah, I don't down know. on TCU. Yeah, I thought TCU was going to suck again. I'll just put it. And <laughs> uh, I don't I don't feel as strongly about it anymore. And I know you don't either. Yeah, I no, don't. Yeah, I think it was in five points when yep. I made that clear. So yeah, I went in thinking that TCU would suck against probably strong. They were they, they did suck at the beginning of last year, three right. and three and five, and rebounded nicely and finished the year four and one. I thought that they were going to be average at best again, maybe a little above average, nothing more than seven wins. Um, probably sell them a little bit short because I think when Gary Batterson goes to the microphone, I think kind of like Coach Kleiman, he's honest to a fault and a little bit more genuine than you're going to get from a typical head coach. And because he was last year, so right. I have you know evidence and you know past history to kind of draw from. Last year he shit all over his team, crapped all over his team. Sorry. <laughs> hey, we're leaving it. Yeah, we're like, yeah but but he like, kind of did, and yeah. I remember because you know, I remember you put Dy in a car for a podcast, and all of a sudden he thinks we. <laughs> because fine. I remember we talked about last year, right after that press conference, me and Matt said, "Man, he just like." You know, poo pooed all over his team. That's the third way I've tried did. to describe that. But we both said that. We're like, wow, I don't like TCU as much. And then they started three and five. I was like, so this guy usually has a pretty good pulse of his team. Right. And this year, he just built up the expectations higher and higher as that press conference went on. Um, they still got to figure out and find a solution at quarterback that they feel confident in. I think he feels confident in his quarterbacks. I just don't know which one he. I don't think he knows which one he's going to pick yet. But I think he's got a couple that he feels good about that can do the damage that he wants wants to see. But I think the Horn Frogs have a really good chance this year. You know, Oklahoma State a little bit like TCU. Those are two programs that are almost always it seems you know winning eight nine ten games a season Oklahoma State had won ten at least three in a row. Then they fell off big time last year. One of the schools K State really put it on in the Big Twelve. Mike Gundy blamed himself, and it wasn't one of those, oh, it's my fault, you know, that kind of stuff. I'll say it again, the Bob Huggins fake accountability. 
It was, no, I let things go in practice. It is my fault. I got lazy at this point in this 14 years. Um, whether he, he fixes it all this year, we'll see. But I really uh, was impressed by hearing Mike Gundy say all those things. Yeah, his solution is just not letting as many things or letting anything go the way that he did last year. Just, you know, bringing in more discipline, more toughness. And, of course, I don't know if they really had a choice in the matter because I think they had some coaches that left for what they consider better options. So there was a little bit of a staff shakeup. And, of course, Charlie Dickey, Charlie Dickey's there now in, in Stillwater. But, yeah, he compared it a little bit to, you know, the three children he has. He said the two oldest ones says, you know, Dad, what you let this uh, young, young kid get away with, you would have never let us get away with. And he thinks that's kind of what happened in his 14th season at Oklahoma State. So, uh, obviously, probably might be a little bit of a harsh year for some of those players because they're going to have a – come to Jesus moment a little bit, a yeah. little bit uh, a little bit more strict, so it's probably not going to be as fun in Stillwater as it might have been the last couple of seasons. We'll see if that's the fix. I'm still weary that it's not. I am too. You know, we talk about Oklahoma State a lot and they're they're that team that I'm like, after the three or four teams that I, I think we all acknowledge are pretty good in the league, they're like, well, somebody else has to be good. And I was saying Oklahoma State, maybe TCU's a better pick, but I think they'll be fun to interesting to watch, but like TCU as well, they're similar teams in a lot of ways. You know, both still have questions at quarterback, both have a great playmaker receiver in Tylen Wallace for Oklahoma State and Jalen Rager for TCU. TCU's defense is probably better, of course, at least on paper. But, I mean, there's a lot of similarities in those there two is. programs heading into this season. There is. I, I tend to think that the horn, the options, probably because they just have more. But, have, oh, but yeah, TCU, I, I tend to think that they're going to find a better answer at quarterback, which makes me think I like the Horned Frogs more. because, And it might just be because, you know, all of their guys are kind of well-known. even. Right, right. <laughs> Texas Tech and Matt Wells, I think, was next. Uh, I'm going to throw Chris Kleiman out of the who was the most impressive out of the four coaches because I'm probably biased covering Kansas State. Absolutely. But if, if I'm going to throw him out, for me, Matt Wells was number one. I thought Matt Wells yes. was significantly well, significantly more impressive than Les Miles. And I thought he was relatively, it was relatively clear to me. I thought he was just sharper, more charismatic, more impressive than Neil Brown. I thought Matt Wells, from a, you know, what can you learn from a, from a press conference, right? But from a press conference perspective, was very sharp. I thought he was very sharp and I would have put him over both Neil Brown and Les Miles as well, probably on the same level of, yep. as Chris Kleiman, so to, if, if push came to shove on that one. Um, and then the, the, I think the biggest takeaway from Texas Tech I had just is like, they're going to be the complete opposite that they were under Cliff Kingsbury because Cliff Kingsbury is like, we're going to throw the ball around the yard, we're going to throw it 50 times, we're going to throw it for 500 yards, we're going to give up 700 yards. Like that, that's what Texas Tech football has been, and probably not even under Cliff Kingsbury, almost every, oh, co every coach in Lubbock. And now they're going to a guy that uh, on Monday, the only thing he, things he seemed to have a desire to discuss were how important the tight end was, yep. how much they had to run the football, and how much they had to have championship caliber defense. Yeah, that's that's a big theme, and you wrote about that in your five points on Monday. You know, I mean, there, I don't. The Big Twelve is not going away from spread offense or for high octane offense or scoring points, but there are more people in the league than ever before. Why well, say ever before? In the last five, ten years, committed to those kind of things. So that's a big difference. Yeah, I was because yeah, think about it because even in the you. Judge Les Miles for what he's done in the past week, but that's yep. that's how he got the job done at LSU Absolutely. in Oklahoma State. That's how Matt Campbell gets the job done at Iowa State. That's what Chris Kleiman wants to do at Kansas State, and now they got Matt Wells doing the same thing at uh, Texas Tech, and I believe Matt Rule is kind of the same thing at Matt Baylor. Rule wants to do that. Yes. He's had to go away from it because of his personnel a little bit at right. Baylor in those first couple of years. So I'm not, you know, maybe yeah, maybe Tech and Baylor will still be quote unquote spread you know but there's going to be physical still that's half the league that you could say will probably at times get under center put tight ends on the field and try to play you know try to play defense yeah I, it, the, the league is i guess it comes in cycles and i think you're seeing a cycle a little bit the other way we just had a gentleman ride by in a motorcycle that's a big guy flanders without a shirt on without a shirt on <laughs> it's hot out here too but i mean it makes a lot of sense Oklahoma, uh, you talk about championship caliber defense. They certainly have not had it. And Lincoln Riley's honest about that. They hired a guy that I know you know all about, think the world of, and Alex Grinch out of what was it, Washington State originally, then Ohio State. Is that how yeah. it worked for him? Yep. Um, and Lincoln Riley, who I think the world of, minces no words about how disappointed he's been <laughs> in their defensive performance and how it's not acceptable. And he'll also tell you they're going to be way better this year. I don't know if they will or won't, but I think they have a better, they may have one of the best defense corners right. in football. Right. I don't know how what number to put on it. Top five, top three. I mean, he's a very highly thought of name, and I think Oklahoma's defense will probably get better under It'll him. probably get better just because of him putting his touches on it. You would have to think that they're not going to be the finished product 
until two or three years probably. But it'll, they'll probably come faster just because they'll have the talent to kind of put that in high gear a little bit quicker. But the biggest takeaway I had personally was when the guy said, you know, <laughs> I, I, ex- say, I expect yeah. your offense to dip because you're going to lose Kyler Murray and four starting offensive linemen from a year ago. Will your defense get more better than how much your offense will dip? And Lincoln Riley's answer is, I don't think my offense is going to dip. Yep. And it was so funny <laughs> because you could watch him. He was kind of pissed off. Right. He was kind of angry, and he was trying to decide how polite does he want to be with his yes. answer, or does he just want to say my offense there was a pause. isn't going to get worse. Right. <laughs> and then he just came out with my offense isn't going to get worse. Now, whether it will or won't, I don't know. They lost four starting linemen off the yeah. great offensive line. I think it'll be fine. They lost, they lost, of course, Kyler Murray. But holy cow, when you have Jalen, Jalen Hurts, Trey Sermon, Kennedy McCoy, Kennedy Brooks, C.D. Lamb. Yeah. Uh, Kennedy Brooks, yeah. He's uh, so C. good. C.D. <laughs> Lamb. Uh, Grant Calcaterra at tight end, uh, and their offensive line will be good. And I, I want to like, say, even when when uh, Lincoln said that, he's and I keep going back to it because mm-hmm. it was it was funny to me. I, for some reason, it's one of the most palpable moments that, during Big Twelve Media Day to me. He says, you know, I don't think my offense is going to dip, and I, I, it really seemed like he wanted to finish that with M. Effort. <laughs> right, right, yeah, absolutely. He was unhappy. Good thing he didn't say that, Flando. Again, this guy is so willing to put to put words on the cast here that stole that from the Boscos on the podcast. <laughs> No, Flanders uh, Shan Shan do it. That's all of day one, right? We covered Kansas, we covered uh, Texas TCU. Tech, we covered TCU, we covered Oklahoma State, we covered OU. Oklahoma. Funniest line from day one, DY. You got two choices. You got the Gary Patterson. I was fifth in line for my wife and just cockroach waited it out. DNA. <laughs> exactly, and got and got her. Or Mike Gundy saying completely deadpan. Well, Oklahoma was able to overcome some average quarterback play the last two seasons. Which was funnier to you? Uh, Gundy, Gundy's was probably funnier to me, but I still like Riley's even more. <laughs> right, well, yeah, yeah, it was a good time. I mean, so day two, we've talked all about Chris Kleiman in Kansas State. He went fourth, if I remember correctly, on day two. Day one, we may not have as much about this because let's be honest. Like, so first was Matt Campbell Matt in Iowa Campbell. State, and we were all out covering. Yeah. Fortunate that Kansas State, Ryan Lackey made sure we got extra access, with, not just us, all the K-State media yeah. with K-State players. So I'm not going to lie and sit here and tell you we listened to Matt Campbell speak. We saw him. He looks great. He looked hot. He looked, yeah. I mean, he's, he's <laughs> and, and I will say this, the buzz, if you go on Twitter or you talk to anyone that was in Jerry World, um, because obviously everyone you know talked, everyone said he was amazing and that yep. he was probably the best head coach throughout the two days. So. That's all That's all I've read, too. I mean, you move on. Iowa State, we talked about them for a second. I mean, they were picked third, you know, mm-hmm. in the league. One of the few teams, you've talked a lot, Derek, about how quarterbacks are more uncertain in the Big 12 than maybe they have been in some time. But they're one of the few teams that it's Brock Purdy. You know, he's a good one. Yep. Um, I almost said Chubba Purdy. It's Brock Purdy. You know he's a good <laughs> well, one. Chubba's his brother. You know, what, you know what they've got there. They had some losses, of course, at running back, at receiver. Uh, but, I mean, they probably are the safest bet to they're, finish third in the league. They're the one that deserved to be predicted, to be predicted third. Uh, whether you want to believe that they're going to reach that is, you know, is up to you. They're the one that deserved that ranking. And I know that even some in this car won't agree. I think Brock Purdy is closer to Jalen Hurts and Sam Ellinger than people realize. He may be. I mean, we'll find out this year. He's got a chance to have – a huge year. I mean, because he came on so strong last year. He was a true freshman last year, wasn't yes. he? I mean, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see what, what he does. Baylor with Matt Rule's up. We heard him a little bit more. Um, I know not as much. The thing I took away from it. Not as boring. As, no, not as boring for sure. <laughs> um, and Matt Rule, uh, he did. He made no effort today to try to lower expectations. He talked about wanting to compete for the Big 12 championship. He talked about how much further along they are. He wasn't cocky. He wasn't arrogant. He was polite. But the words he said, I mean, he expects Baylor to be a competitive, legitimately competitive team in the top probably three or four of the Big 12 this year. I think I ta- t- told you both of uh, this and what I thought, and I thought that Baylor was being undersold for the last couple of weeks when all those rankings came out. They're my dark horse team to kind of you know finish in the top four in the Big 12 possibly. I think they're getting undersold in Oklahoma State oversold. So if we're talking about that three, the four, the five, then teams that really aren't getting a lot of buzz, obviously Iowa State is, but then I kind of like – uh, kind of like what I'm hearing out of TCU and Baylor right now. So that that's kind of how I v- view him. And and to be honest, he's kind of – I said this earlier, he's, or not not on the pod, but he's a man of the people. He was the only no head doubt. coach I saw out there. He just had lunch with the media instead of going somewhere else. It's absolutely true. And I think something with Baylor, we've talked about this a lot too, is, is when you cover a certain team, I think all of us, you know, Flando driving, Nelson at home, everybody who helps us, Casey and his fan, watches every bit of football they can. We watch a lot of Big 12 football. But you can fall into the trap of watching a team play one game, 
like I did with you know TCU against K State last year, right. and I'm probably applying that too much to this year. My point is with Baylor. I don't like them because I don't think Charlie Brewer's very good. I, but probably just because he played poorly against K-State last year. I think a lot of people think he's a good player. And if Charlie Brewer is a good player, then I'm with you. Yeah, Baylor should be competitive in the league. <laughs> you just spit all over. I just spit all over. Yeah. But uh, you're, you're yeah. probably right that it's going to come down to the play of Charlie Brewer. Because despite too. me yeah. thinking that Baylor's going to you know, perhaps finish on top four, I'm not a huge Charlie Brewer guy either. Right. And, and it is a result more of just – he wasn't just poor against K-State. He was putrid, and he almost cost him the game. I mean, it, uh, and it's weird because I think they scored like 35 points. But <laughs> Right. No, they scored plenty, exactly. So I, and I, I even bet you if you pull up the stats, they probably look all right for Charlie Brewer. But I, I, I think he – That was uh, a game I just felt like he had a lot of time to throw. He ran himself he, he found, into a lot of exactly. sacks, didn't he? He found a way to get himself into a lot of sacks. He found a way to run into pressure. He found a way to miss a lot of open guys. I mean, his numbers might look good in that game because K-State missed more tackles in that game than probably – their top two or three combined, you know, but I, th- I just remember thinking Charlie Brewer concerned me at quarterback. And it's funny we're having this kind of conversation because the worst game we, we talked about this too, the worst game we saw last year was definitely Kansas State TCU. Right. Oh, my <laughs> that was, was awful. rough. It was a really rough <laughs> game. Uh, the last, no, there's Texas. We'll talk about them at the end probably. West Virginia is interesting to me because in some ways I thought Neil Brown said a lot of really good things that I thought were well said, agreed with it. Yeah. But again, if we're being if we're being honest and critiquing things. Uh, I thought from just a preparedness, comfort, charisma standpoint, to me, he was a solid level below Chris Kleiman and Matt Wells. Yeah, I think he was. And it, it just, and I think comfort is probably the word to put it. He didn't seem uh, okay in his own shoes, so to speak, in front of everyone. Like Kleiman doesn't, didn't really seem rattled. He was never unsettled. Matt Wells was never rattled or unsettled. I wouldn't say that Neil Brown was ever rattled, so to speak, but he never seemed settled. He seemed very nervous. Correct. He came up very nervous, and I gave. And that doesn't know, mean he won't be a good no, coach. No, it doesn't yeah. exactly. I mean, and it doesn't mean, like I said, it doesn't mean Les Miles can't be successful. It just means those. This is what we witnessed, so this is what we're going to yeah, talk th- about. Yeah, it was a media day, so. right? And I'm, they didn't play a game. Yeah, you know, exactly. So this is what we're going <laughs> to talk about. Um, and Neil Brown, I gave, I gave Les Miles. I don't know if I gave him guff for this, but I noted that he brought up a notebook to read off of, which I'd never seen. Yeah, yeah, uh, Neil I, Brown needed that. Some too. He brought up a, at least a piece of paper to re, to read some names of his team off of. Unfortunately, uh, it wasn't was, even yeah. it wasn't even the names of, of any random players. It was the, the name of the guys that he brought. Correct. So <laughs> that was that was unique. I mean, you know, and you think, oh, they're just new to their program. Matt Wells rattled off half of his roster. <laughs> no, that, that, no, that was no exaggeration either. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's just be honest. Like, if these guys are needing these sheets, we're talking about public speaking or whatever. But that we're not going to know. It's it's weird. It's a little weird to see at a setting like this. Flando wouldn't even need a shit, I don't think. He just wouldn't say anything. But exactly. uh, but again, I'm not ready to you know jump all over Neil Brown. I'm not ready to say he can't be successful at West Virginia. I think he can be. But it wasn't a tremendous first impression for me is all I'm getting at. Yeah, it wasn't. And I, I guess I would have just liked to at least – these guys have been on the job now, these new coaches, almost seven or eight months. And while they're still probably finding out how good some of their own players are, I do expect them to be familiar and know their names and yeah. know, the, know their positions. And I felt that Matt Wells absolutely did. Like you said, there was no exaggeration. That dude rattled off like 38 players right. during – not even a breakout session. It was the actual podium At press the podium conference. in front of hundreds of media. <laughs> yeah. Effortless. And Chris Kleiman, we know we've, – we've talked to him a number of different times. He's well aware of his entire roster and is yep. trying to develop a relationship with them. And But he'll admit he's still trying to figure out how good some of them are, but he knows who they are. I'm not uh, convinced that Neil Brown, especially since – he needed a piece of paper to remember who even the four guys he brought to Arlington with him were right. and, and Les Miles. I am not convinced that those two are very – as familiar with the roster, I think you should be seven or eight months into the job. Yeah, I completely agree, and I don't know how to really argue against it. I mean, I think that's it is what it is. Doesn't mean they can't – doesn't mean they can't be better than Chris Kleiman and Matt Wells, but yeah. that's what we see, you know, right now. The last school to go was Texas. I don't know about UDY. I didn't pay a lot of attention to them either because they went directly after K State. You know, we so, were eating, so, so we're eating. We're trying to talk to K State. We're trying to put stuff up. But we heard, you know, we heard Tom uh-huh. Herman a little bit. I, he, he's same as last year. Incredibly polished, almost too polished. Yeah. If I'm going to be critical, he's very rehearsed. Very rehearsed. But I tell you what, I mean, he's got a great football program. Um, they're on the way up. I know he thinks they're going to move in the right direction. They're as good as they've been since Mac Brown. Right. Right. Um, did you hear anything newsworthy from him today or that made you feel differently? I'm just going to be quite honest. All I heard him talk about a little bit was the Sam Ellinger, um, Baker Mayfield, Terry Bradshaw stuff, you know, where I think 
You know, there's been some, that's all I heard him talk did, about. Did he, uh, you know? did he did he correct anyone for saying St. Melinger wrong? <laughs> I didn't. I don't think so. But that was something I know. I told the boss because I was like, I'll give you a nickel to pronounce it Ellinger. Ellen, I'm, I'm trying to I say I like that he yeah. does that, too. Yeah, I do, too, and he's polite when he does it. But if you ever say Sam Ellinger's name wrong, he will correct you for darn sure. But, well, and I like the protection that he gives to his player because I bet Sam Ellinger respects that and appreciates that. And I, that, that is one thing I will say about Tom. Tom Herman's a good coach. Like, I don't give him enough praise, probably. He's a very good coach. Yeah. But even though I criticize a little bit of what it feels rehearsed or polished, I do believe Tom Herman cares about his players. Um, I think he's phony to us. I don't think he's phony to his exactly players. Exactly right. I, be- I believe that for I believe that's real. Um, because, like, somebody asked him, I thought it was a smartly worded question. Like, when you heard all the negative comments about Sam Ellinger, were you excited because it was going to, you know, motivate him and you could use that for bulletin board? And I, his answer was like, no, I really wasn't. I didn't like hearing people talk about Sam Ellinger that way. That's his guy. So that's his guy. And, I mean, love Texas, hate Texas, believe they're back, believe they're not back. They've got their head coach and they've got their quarterback. If the rest of that roster comes through, they can challenge Oklahoma this year. One thing I, I didn't like, and I guess if, if it's him, I understand why he doesn't like it. I, I guess he says he he thinks it's funny that so many uh, uh, other opponents and players and coaches live or have Texas living in their heads so much that they that they would do the disrespectful horns down thing. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's it's true, you know. I mean it is it is true, but boy, I tell you what, you'd probably rather not see those horns down if you're Texas because it means they've done something to give them reason. To right? Yeah. Them. My but, thing is, I but think, I know I, I get the point. It for sure. makes me cringe when he calls that disrespectful because I just think that shit's fun to me. But at the same time, uh, Oklahoma does it so much that right. I think it's weird. <laughs> a little bit. I think it is a little bit. I mean, you'll see shirts, you know, crimson <laughs> and cream shirts with the horns down as their logo. So and they do it in games that they're not even playing Texas. Right, which is also. <laughs> pretty funny i think we're 42 or so minutes into this thing we've talked to every team and we've talked all of k-state i mean but i i don't have to wrap this up because we're still five hours from being home let's talk a couple fun things so listen if you're listening to the kso show right now brought to you as always by the tall grass tap house and k-state online and Harry's and Bourbon and Baker and I, typically the work of Flando. What were you going to say? I'd like some tall grass in this car right oh, now. I know. Not, um, not actually tall yeah, grass, but yeah. the food from there. Yeah. Right. That makes a lot more <laughs> sense. So let's – so, but if you're listening, we're going to probably start talking about dumb stuff. So if you don't want to hear us not talk about, you know, Big 12 football, that kind of thing, go ahead and turn it off and I will not be offended because D.Y., very important questions. I want you to talk through to the people listening what your last two experiences were at were like at Big 12 Media Days because we were at the Ford. Did they call it the Ford Center? What do they call that little? The, stars? the Star was the hotel. The Ford Center was the actual football facility where right. we were at. So, yeah, I like that one better from a functionality standpoint. Uh, uh, we actually, it's going to be weird because I'm going to sound like that great, that, that old, say that, it. That, say old it head, that old head media member that just complains about everything. I'm going right. to be that guy. Do it. There wasn't enough food. There wasn't very much food. I mean, when I say when we say not very much, I mean there literally was not a snack there. You no. know, I mean there was not one. So you you had like forty five minute time period where they had food out, and outside of that, there was no food. Another slight frustration of mine, and maybe you guys can correct me, but I only ever saw like uh, Seven Up, Dr Pepper, whatever. You had a big full basketball today. They have one thousand sodas and every variety of, of Diet Right and RC Cola and Sunkiss you could ever imagine. They also ran out of bottles of water. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, but, well, but we're being critical. Let's let's talk yeah. the cool stuff. Like, 18, that stadium is, cool. is amazing, yeah, right? That's like, amazing. I, I, I was just thinking about how it would be to, like, watch a football game from there. Yeah. Because there's, like, these entire clubs that are, like, sideline level. <laughs> yeah, they've got the Miller Light Club on one side and the, the DraftKings Kings. Club on the other. And I'll tell you guys a little secret. They're, they're identical. Yeah. You know? So I'll tell you what. One just has a Miller Lite logo on it. One has DraftKings. If you ever had a game, a Cowboys game, you're like, which one should I go to? They are literally identical. So and they don't actually have alcohol in them. Like so don't stress too. that. Yeah, and they both have really multiple really, really nice bars. So, so we talked through that. Let's well, talk about. I was oh, kind of got, amazed. Got, uh, the inside the stadium is a little bit of a maze because we were going to the Fox Sports thing and we got lost. We sure did. That was another thing. If we're going to be critical about, <laughs> listen, listen, guys, our job is the easiest job in the world. Yes. Everybody listening to this has a tougher job than we do. And so when we complain, you can call us babies because we are being <laughs> babies right now. We are fully aware of it. But man, the direction to say go up the elevator and then find Section A. That Jerry World's awfully big. And we went up the elevator. And there was no Section A. And there was no Section A. <laughs> and then Valerie, who's a very nice lady, the Fox Sports rep who does all. She this also stuff, got lost. She got lost. She it was her asked, event. She's like, did you guys find this okay? And I didn't want to make her feel bad, so I was like, oh, we figured it out okay. But it was kind of tough. She's like, yeah, I got lost too. So that wasn't that wasn't great either. What I will say, I thought. 
I thought the actual get together itself, though, was it was better. Fun. It was, it was better, better than, than the one last, last year, year. It, because more people actually came yeah, to it this funny. time. Gene Taylor was in there having oh, drinks yeah, it was with Carl Ice. It was it was a inter- that was, that's when you got to have your nice little fun interview with Joel Clatt. Oh, Joel, Man, Cl- Joel Clatt might might love you as much as you love him now. We got pretty friendly. <laughs> I mean, we even had some fun talks off camera afterwards. He added some color to some of those K State Colorado <laughs> stories. He genuinely respects K-State. And I told him, I said afterwards, I don't know if this is true or not, but this is funny. I said, hey, man, every K-State person will tell you from that team that, that you know, they called it a, a coverage they had not worked on all year. I think, I think Clatt's words will up. It kind of looked that way. I mean, so, but he is legitimately incredibly intelligent. Uh, I just love Joel Clatt. From a, I think he's the best. Like I, I told him this. Yeah. I think he is the best national college football analyst. Uh, and if I, you disagree, I'll headbutt you right now. I know. I, I totally agree. And I well, <laughs> we had this conversation too. I will say, I think they made it difficult to get to because you had to walk to the entire Cowboys team shop you did. to to get to this uh, bar or club area. I'm like, man, this is just like a, a advertising ploy, marketing we to, ploy. We had to walk through. Yeah, the entire. T- <laughs> uh, it was in the Hall of Fame, I think. The other. Uh, talk up Speak Joel up. Clatt like, I was just gonna say like he also after Watch so many road. interviews was still really cool with you like after like in did That's five thing, man 50 more after that like so Flando and I well all of us you know even Bosco's came in we're super nerds the thing started at what four o'clock we got there at 351 because I wanted to be there first to get Joel Clatt get that video done get out of the way and then but you know he shows up and I'm like I'm not gonna attack the guy as soon as he gets here because there's beers there and stuff and it's supposed to be like a you know what do they call it a gathering get together a social that kind of stuff but my goodness everybody else did not wait so we had to you know they grabbed him immediately and we ended up going like sixth but I'm impressed at those guys the other celebs there Reggie Bush has the most swag of anyone I've ever like he is very trendy in his attire still Reggie Bush is still a guy that when I would see him, like, see, I, I've never seen him in person before, I don't think. And so then same with this sitting, I was like, that's Reggie Bush. Matt Leinert looked pretty good, I thought, too. So would you take Leinert and Bush as your two, you know, uh, guys with Clatt and Bruce Feldman, who's very good. You, yep. you talked to him last year, didn't you? Yes, Feldman? I did last year. And I think, uh, uh, don't want to, like. Kurtz did. Yeah, I was going to say, Kurtz got him this year. I don't want to spoil it. I hope I didn't. It'll be somewhere. Kurt, Kurt, stop listening. Yeah, he's not listening. We're almost 50 minutes in, <laughs> and you've cussed like nine times. So <laughs> Kurt's got offended and turned this thing off. Um, but so you, would you take Leinert and Bush over Robert Smith and Brady Quinn? From a present standpoint, I think, because I don't uh, – Reggie Bush is not like one of my heroes or idols or, or like favorite players ever, and I don't typically get starstruck, but I was like, man – I, I kind of got a Star Trek around him, and I'm, I don't even look at him that way. Right. <laughs> my, I love. I think it's great those guys were there. The, my only little beef with That's, Bush and Liner is yeah. they're both USC guys from you know California who aren't from Big Twelve country. So, and they, I mean Liner, I, I didn't hear. Liner, Bush speak. I think Liner was good. Liner was prepared. I didn't hear Bush speak. Um, but Brady Quinn was so good last right. year because he called K State games. Right. Exactly. That's that's the difference. So let me, if you could have two former Big Twelve players, they got to be retired, they got to be out of the NFL, that we're going to come talk at that setting. Like what guys come to mind? If we're going to replace Bush and Liner next year with two Big Twelve guys to be our extra, let's let's hit on these dude celebs yeah. at the setting. What Big Twelve players are you picking? Oh, I mean, let's let's talk through. You got Vince Young. Yeah, I don't know if Vince is good in that setting though. Probably not. Uh, Terrence Newman, Kansas State fame. That would is be he good. Is he still playing? Jordy, Jordy Nelson. Jordy would be good. He was good on the air with Kurt. So yeah. Let's think of some non. Some let's be fair and think of some non K State. Like is uh, Sam Bradford still in the league? Yeah. Yeah. We can't have Sam Bradford. Maybe. Um, Man, we're oh, not good at this. Boy, guys. Major Applewhite would be fun. You know, yeah. he's, is he out of work, I feel is like? It, is yeah. he not coaching? Well, he got fired by Houston, you know. Oh, I don't know. What about he's our, 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 our Bryles? Jamal Charles. Yeah. Oh, 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 come on. see Jamal. Come on. <laughs> I know he would be great. Do you hear what I said? I said our Bryles. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> Man, maybe we get Bill Snyder and Dana Holgerson. I mean, oh. I mean, Olgie's busy, but I love – you know, get those two a little riled up. Mike Leach. You know, oh, he's Mike busy. Mike would be uh, good. Uh, those yeah. guys just gotta hurry up and retire, man. We really fail on this question. We're gonna start to <laughs> we're gonna wrap this thing up a little bit. Again, we are on the road. I don't know where are we. <laughs> uh, we're coming up on Ardmore, maybe. I don't know. We passed Norman a little bit ago. This is not Ardmore. No, we passed Ardmore. I think a oh, long yeah, time. Yeah. I don't know where we are. I think we're through Oklahoma City, or we could be in Oklahoma City. But we appreciate you taking the time to listen. Uh, lots of coverage. I, I hope you all enjoy it from the Big 12 Football Media Days. We'll be excited. we got fall camp kicking off here in a couple weeks. We've got a basketball thing on Wednesday. Uh, we've talked so much to D.Y. about it. It's, 
we, we've uh, we want more stuff to do kind of right now. Yeah. The July kind of we're dead period recruiting and that kind of stuff. But we're back in that season pretty much. We're almost there. Yeah, we're almost there. Two weeks, August first, first day of football camp. For Derek Young, for Grant Flanders, I appreciate he drove both ways for us, and he's going to put this pod on the site and everything. So really appreciate him. That wraps up car cast number two. We'll do number three at some point this year on the road. This has been the KSO Show, and we end it by asking you to do one gosh darn thing for us. Tell your gosh darn friends.